My name is Andy. I help people live life on purpose. This podcast explores the mystery, beauty, and complexity of life through conversations with an array of incredible practitioners, all of them working at the edge of what's possible for humanity. This is a place for big dreams, bold creativity, and fierce hope. Welcome to the Wonder Dome. If you're inspired by this conversation and you'd like to see it reach more people, you can help the Wonder Dome take flight by sharing it with friends and colleagues, subscribing, giving us a high star rating, and best of all, leaving a glowing review. If you'd like to go even further, consider becoming a monthly supporter. You'll help me keep the lights on and support a wide range of charitable causes. You can learn more at mindfulcreative.coach. Thanks in advance for helping us inspire the world. called Precipice, composed by my guest, Sira Sharad. Precipice is a cliff face, an edge. In my conversation today with Cirrus, we explore those edges in many different ways. Cirrus is something of a polymath, a musician, a novelist, a journalist, a film critic. His work has appeared in a range of publications from the New Statesman to the Telegraph. He's a regular music writer for The Stool Pigeon, a film critic for Little White Lies, and a cultural commentator for Google's Think Quarterly. He's also written extensively on Iranian culture, having lived in Tehran and served both as a correspondent for The Sunday Times and home news editor of English language daily Iran News. His short fiction has been published in Ambit and Hotshoe, and his novel The White World won the Telegraph's novel in a year competition in 2006. He lives in London, where he makes music under the moniker Hiatus. And it's that moniker, that music, that brought Cirrus and I together. Several years ago, my wife and I were on a road trip and we had one of those auto stations that you can get from streaming music services that just keeps serving up new songs based on your interests. And we had a, some sort of ambient station on, just nice background music while we talked and enjoyed the scenery. And then this track came on and it cut through our awareness like an emotional knife. And we both, we both were like, what is this? It was the track Turbine off Cirrus' album, Ghost Notes. And from that moment forward, I was hooked. His music for me has become a container for grief, for joy, for love, for loss. Over the years, as I've navigated what it is to be a human of integrity and purpose, his music has been right there with me, helping me shape the feelings, the joys, the struggles. And I'm so excited because not only are you gonna to get to hear some of his music on this show, including, if you listen all the way to the end, a full version of the track that this show opened with, you're also gonna get to hear from the person himself an artist in process, like all of us in process, sharing what it is to create something beautiful and meaningful in a world that commodifies almost everything. How do we stay true to ourselves and what's inside of us and bring that into the world? And Cirrus has a lot of wisdom to share on that. So, let's get settled in. Take a deep breath. hear what Cirrus has to share with us. Cirrus, welcome to the Wonder Dome. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's such a treat. That's a pleasure to be here, I think. Thank you. Yeah. 
So this is, um, I'm having a bit of a fanboy moment for people who've, who've listened to the intro. They know that you are a talented musician, a writer, um, but I've been a fan of your music now for years. My wife and I put on like an ambient music playlist once on a road trip and your song Turbine came up off your album, mm-hmm. Those Notes. And both of us are just like, what is this, right? Like there was... Mm-hmm. Ambient music, for those who don't know, is this sort of atmospheric, it's lovely, it's gentle, you can kind of be in the background, but this song just foregrounded for us. And, and from there, we, we both have gone down the rabbit hole, have really listened to all of your music, and it, and it has this wonderful, cathartic, healing quality. So when I reached out to you and invited you here, I was kind of like inviting you both as, as someone who I see as a true artist who's really doing the work and making stuff that is real and authentic, but also kind of as a fan. It's like, oh, this is cool. I want to like just connect with him. And so here we are. I'm pretty it's excited. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so much territory we could cover, but maybe, um, maybe we could start just hearing a bit more from you about how how you came to music because mm. i know that wasn't your first profession and we can kind of trace some threads but like yeah how, how did it click for you that that making music particularly instrumental forward instrumental heavy music mm. was something that really spoke to you i suppose you know and any musician who has a kind of life uh, a life story that involves you know music music is obviously there there at the kind of earliest memory you know it's like uh, as a kid I mean, it, it's not going to be different to anyone else's stories really in terms of like as a kid i had records and and i obsessed over certain musicians and um one thing that i was really really in, interested in was soundtrack music even even when i was really young i was obsessed with the music of films um i used to try and but well, I, I used to record the 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 uh, the soundtracks to the films that i love the most dune the um, the david lynch oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i actually i filled a um the, so the, actually it's ironically probably the cheesiest piece of music on the whole soundtrack it's that 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 end theme that, that i don't know if you know the film but at the end there's this kind of piano piece which really looking at it now is not the best bit of music on that soundtrack <laughs> but i was so into it that i recorded it i managed somehow to figure out how to run a i guess it was probably a phono lead from the video player that we had into a tape deck and i just recorded that piece of music from a vhs cassette or a betamax or whatever it was onto a 90 minute cassette onto one side of it repeatedly just that same song over and over again so that i could listen to it. just the idea of listening to it without being interrupted and having to go back and play it again actually i mean this is kind of jumping forward a bit but it's interesting because i do listen to music on loop a lot you know I, yeah. now you know now still one of my biggest peeves with spotify is that it doesn't take looping music seriously enough like mm-hmm. I, iTunes, you know, for all its faults, when you put something on loop, when you put a song on loop, certainly on the version of iTunes that I have, everything that you play from there on is on loop. And that really appeals to me because I'm kind of like, I, if, if I generally, if I like something, I want to listen to it over and over and over again. That can be a bit of a, you know, a kind of a, a, a joy killer in some ways. But, <laughs> but I just think maybe that was there, you know, early on. You're just just wanting to listen to the same thing over and over and over again. How old were you at that time-ish? Probably, I would say, eight or nine, maybe. Yeah. Um, it was pretty obsessive. Um, and And then... And this was in when, the London, London area. This yeah, I was growing. I was growing up south of London, so I, I, where I am now, which is Maidstone, is a kind of town um, on the sort of you know in the in the I would say like the you know it's in Kent, so it's in a, a different county. But we spent a lot of time in London growing up. I obviously live there now. Um, yeah, the, the 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 music thing was. I mean, I played the piano as a kid. I I, I took lessons in the piano. It was terrible horrible kind of student never practiced never actually <laughs> learned to um, read music so I still to this day you know I took lessons for a few years I had this long suffering piano teacher who I think sensed that I had some inherent musicality 
and she refused to give up on me and she just mm. kept, you know, over and over again, trying and trying and trying. And, and I just never got it. I never got the, 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 you know, the idea of sitting down and kind of playing by rote someone else's music never appealed to me. Playing the piano was, was like probably the thing that I spent most of my time doing, but I could never get my head around why I would want to play something that someone else had yeah. written down note for note. So I, so I did that until, you know, until I, until I was kind of all through my school days. At university, I, I started playing music in bands, started DJing, um, got really into electronic music. Um, and, and then, and then when, I, when I kind of moved to London as, as an adult and started working in, in, in journalism, uh, a friend of mine who's still a very close friend of mine um, who lives in San Francisco um, sent me a, a copy of Reason, the, um, the, the kind of propeller heads music making software. And I just started making, I guess, what you'd kind of call like, I don't know, trip hop. I was really into like, you know, sampling stuff. I became obsessed with getting old records and kind of getting these little kind of, you know, crackly vinyl samples of things that I loved and then, you know, putting beats. So it was all very derivative. I mean, it was yeah, very kind of influenced <laughs> by, you know, I was very much into the sort of, you know, DJ shadow kind of school of, of, of cinematic kind of instrumental mm -hmm. hip hop. Um, but there was also that kind of, I think, soundtrack thing going on. I was also very into ambient music as well, you know, still am. And I think that the, all of those things were kind of melting, you know, kind of together for, for, for quite a while before I really, before I really found what it was that I, 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 would, I would say before I found a kind of direction of my own. You know, it took, it took a long time. It took, I think it yeah. was done. Yeah, one, I just want to underline how cool it is that even as a nine-year-old, your your radar for music that's cinematic was already right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's something there. I've been thinking a lot about how in our childhood, there's information for us about how we might be as adults. Yeah. Who we might become as adults if we... So much of our society asks us to kind of conform or fit in. But if we just kind of like look back, go, oh, yeah, check that out. Even as a nine-year-old, I love cinematic music. And now check this out now. Yeah. I'm making music that's really cinematic. Yeah. It's, yeah, a it's cool, very true. cool to see that. Very true. I think also for me, you know, I, I, and I think for a lot of kids, um, the sort of line between film and real life was kind of blurred. Yeah. And I just didn't see why life shouldn't have a soundtrack. I mean, like, I was <laughs> like, life is, surely this is the, the biggest sort of story. I mean, all the stuff that happens on films and TV, you know, I wanted, I wanted my life to be sort of the same. I wanted it to have the same kind of drama and the same kind of, you know, magic. And, and music was kind of central to that. It was important, you know. I mean, I remember just being the idea of walking around with headphones, you know, when, when people started getting hold of Walkmans. And, you know, these cassette Walkmans, which, you know, I was kind of suddenly everyone at school was walking around with headphones and just being able to listen to music while basically engaging with the world, you know, going about your life was, was just magic. It was just a, yeah. So, so I think there was that. And it's, and it's, and, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of not technically minded at all, but I think when it comes to things, when it, when creativity is involved, I think it's that kind of there's a there's a weird part that kind of takes over and you just start figuring things out. Mm -hmm. Me and my brother were obsessed with hip hop. You know, growing up, we were kind of fascinated by like in the, but this was like in the you know long before we kind of got into what would be considered like decent hip hop. We were listening to, to kind of like MC Hammer era kind of you know like <laughs> really you know really kind of commercial kind of like. Did you wear the yeah, pants? Yeah. Tell me. Like, late, oh God. I mean, my brother, my brother, could do, my, my brother was into kind of like moonwalking and all kind of, you know, he won like school disco dance competitions and stuff. <laughs> I was never really that, that way inclined, but he, he had a stereo that had a tape deck and a, you know, it was like a kind of a vinyl player on the top CD player. It was all white. It was very, um, it was very high tech for the time. We were very excited about it. And what we figured out was that if we played a tape of, I don't know, like, you know, vanilla ice or, you know, LL Cool J or whatever it was, and then flipped rapidly between the tape deck and the vinyl, we could scratch a seven inch 
and then quickly flip back to the tape. And obviously it was an absolute joke because the vinyl and the tape were never playing at the same time. <laughs> so it would be like a hip hop track suddenly cutting to scratching over silent, <laughs> going back to the hip hop track. But we did it. You know, we were obsessed with it. It was just that, that kind of like, just that obsession, you know, you just make things work, you make things happen. Right. Like it, se- it sounds like there wasn't even a question about should we do this or how do we, it was just like, no, no, Ooh, exactly. we could do that. Let's do more of that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you said something earlier about how it really uh, took time for you to find what you might call mm-hmm. your own voice or your own mm-hmm. way, like your own original expression. So you're sort of doing derivative things and trying stuff out. That feels really important though. I think mm-hmm. there's a sense a lot of pressure we were talking about before we pressed record how there's a lot of pressure to on a lot of people especially young people to curate or manage how they appear mm-hmm. um uh, in the world like even uh yeah. with infinite jest david foster wallace has like mm-hmm. this, this idea that you could have video where literally you have someone else over you in a video because you don't want to have people see how you look in the video right it's sort of like we can filmmakers can do that kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. They can make actors look twenty years younger. There's all this crazy stuff. Yeah, we grew up in a time where where it's just like all of these new technologies kept emerging and kept unfolding, and you're kind of trying stuff out. And I just like I I want to underline that and invite people in to give everyone permission to sort of say if you haven't heard Sirius's music, it's amazing and it's so yeah. you, mm. and. And it, it's not like you were born with that. You were born with the curiosity. Yeah. And you had to kind of keep digging and poking and scratching records and trying out different stuff until something that was really you emerged. I think that's pretty beautiful. I think that's true. But I, you know what I think is interesting is that that um, that thing, that thing that I now consider, you know, the the, the some. I mean, it, the, there was there was there was always a kind of sound that I was searching for you know that Mm -hmm. that I felt was kind of somewhere in me and it was somewhere out there and it was this like melancholic but quite majestic kind of like soaring very cinematic thing I think actually a lot of it I, I, I think a lot of it is rooted also in very early memories of listening to Iranian music, like my dad's mm-hmm. when we were driving and my dad would be listening to old tapes, you know, of these kind of like pre-revolutionary kind of cassette tapes that he had of old singers like Hayad and Gugush and these old kind of Iranian singers. And old Iranian music, a lot of it is very melancholic, very dramatic, very melodramatic, you know, these kind of soaring strings and aching kind of chord changes and... and um, and and I think what clicked for me was a kind of an embrace of that, you know, like mm-hmm. I think that especially that you know, it, it, people may, you know, maybe this isn't necessarily true now, but there's definitely, it felt at times like it was kind of a, it was almost a bit awkward to be open emotionally in music and to kind of encourage people to kind of connect on this like purely sort of like emotional level. I know that a lot, a lot of bands gravitate towards stuff that's a bit more a bit edgier and a bit more kind of challenging you know modern music often is very kind of uh it's not anti-emotional but it's but it's very much about kind of sort of sidestepping emotion and connecting Mm -hmm. with kind of you know more sort of visceral kind of cosmic forces or whatever and I'm all for that but it isn't really you know I mean and I and I love kind of going out to a kind of completely insane techno night as much as anyone else but it isn't really me you know to make that music I've always I listened to techno music and you know I was playing this um, mix driving not long ago by this this DJ called Ben Clock and it's great and I was listening to it but I just you know every time like a track would kind of develop I would just be hearing like a single string somewhere underneath it I'd be like this I, I just don't understand how you wouldn't want to bring in some kind of like you know uh, uh, some this is you know obviously it completely would destroy the point of what he's doing (laughs) but I've always you know I've always sought that quite kind of basic emotional connection in music at the same time it's kind of a balancing act because you know for it to be natural I think it's really important that music doesn't tell you how to feel but rather kind of creates a sort of Mm. space for you to kind of feel something you know, and, and I think the, the music that I find the most moving, the music that I play the most, 
is music that is kind of quite um quite ambiguous in that in that way you know it could be seen as depending on the you know maybe the mood that you're in or what was happening in your life you could listen to it and find it incredibly sort of sad or you could find it incredibly kind of euphoric and sort of uplifting you know but it just has that that's all duality it just is a kind of you know i guess it has some sort of reverence at its you know at its at its center which yeah reverence is a great word yeah a really great word i mean there's there's a whole there's whole scads of research around how music in general can impact our kind of physiological states you know right. change brain waves and and you know the like a great thumping beat has a like effects we're rhythmic we our heart has a rhythm our breath has a rhythm we hear a rhythm in the environment like impacts us but it seems that that seems a b- bit more one pointed. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. if you want to really, if you want to have this kind of ecstatic rave techno experience, we have the formula for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're going to, we can, we can deliver it in, in 10 to, you know, a thousand different ways, but your music has more of a, a container like quality for me. Mm-hmm. Than that, yeah. As you described, there's the, there's space to feel sadness and longing and loss, mm-hmm. melancholy. Mm-hmm. And then in the same song, maybe on the same day at the same moment, or perhaps hearing it a second time or, or a tenth time, suddenly there's space for this kind of hope and uplift mm. and release. Mm. And it sounds like you're, you're really aware of that, of that dynamic and sort of searching for it. And, and, and Yeah. And at the same time, I mean, you know, the whole point of finding something that, you know, that is kind of true is that you kind of need to not fight it too much you know it can't be something that you're like hacking away like jungle you know it's you know there's the 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 stuff that that comes together the most easily the most naturally is usually the stuff that is the best you know the tracks that just kind of materialize almost as if you know they're writing themselves it's it's a cliche but it but you know that that feeling exists the difference i think it's a really interesting point that you raise about the beat i think especially like you know i'm becoming more and more aware of this kind of um duality of like uh experience where there is this kind of very basic very primal kind of cosmic kind of thing going on that we're a part of you know when you dance to a, a bass drum that's 120 bpm you know if you go out to a a club night, which, you know, you'd be lucky to do at the moment. But, you know, in the the times when you could go to, you know, I don't go raving as often as I did, obviously, when I was younger, but I still occasionally go to, I still occasionally go to kind of clubs. I go to kind of nights where I will just these days, you know, I just find myself looking around and I find myself mesmerized by the kind of just the, I'm just awestruck by the, the sort of scale of it as a, as a kind of historical thing, as a thread that connects us to, you know, the first kind of tribes kind of dancing to drums on the kind of tundra or like, you know, the, the, in the deserts of the kind of world as it's like originally formed, you know, like we have that beat at the center of us, you know, there's no doubt it's been written about a great deal and no doubt like people, you know, know that the, there's some kind of correlation between the heartbeat and the, 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 the kind of relentless kind of bass drum. And, you know, we, we, we dance to it in a way that's kind of, uh, you know, it's a kind of an abandonment of, of mm-hmm. emotional obligations. You know, you just surrender to it. It's, it's, it. And I love that. But I also think that there's another side of music, which is like the human story. You know, it's like the connections that we have, the sort of, the, 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 the way that the stories of our lives kind of overlap and all the kind of confusion and chaos and sort of longing and sadness and, all the great and beautiful and terrible things that happen in the, in the human world, Mm. you know, you need more than just a kind of kick drum for that. 
I think, you know. Yeah, I mean, may, you know, maybe maybe it needs the wrong word, but like that, that I think is where, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I guess there's, there's, there's definitely that element to what I do, I suppose, mm-hmm. or try to do. Right, bringing in other parts of the tapestry of the human experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. You said, you spoke earlier, you alluded to the way that um, Iranian music some of the pre-revolutionary Iranian music, you kind of you might have used the word like you kind of reclaimed that or you reconnected that or you kind of brought that in to your music. And and I know from what you've shared with me offline that you sort of came to your Iranian identity a bit later. Like in your mm. 20s, you started to, to you mm. learned to speak Farsi and you right, sort of yeah. started to connect to that lineage more. And that, and that just came up for me as you, as you talked about the human story. And mm. I wonder how... How you make how how that part of your identity shows up for you in your music and and why it's important to you that it's yeah. there and that you claim it explicitly as opposed to just letting it be in the background. I mean, you know, I'm I, I always I'm always reluctant to kind of generalize about um, you know cultures and and people of certain places, but there is a there is definitely a kind of Iranianness. You know, there's this very I mean, I've talked about it before as being Iran as being more of a kind of a a sort of an idea. I mean, maybe that's true of all places, but, you know, Iran feels like this kind of uh, sort of an an idea of a a thing rather than a thing itself. You know, people, Iranians, of of, certainly people like me who have kind of grown up in other countries. I know a lot of Iran. I mean, my mum's English, so I'm kind of half half Iranian, half English. I know a lot of people who are in my position who are kind of, you know, half Iranian who, or um, that they spend a lot of time trying to kind of find out what it is, like what, what Iran is to them. What, what is, you know, what is their obligation to Iran? What is, how can they be a kind of good Iranian? You know, a lot of them also are kind of in families where they, where they would have left Iran and maybe growing up in another country where they didn't have like contact. I mean, you know, growing up, we didn't speak Farsi in my house. My, 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 my dad would take us occasionally to Iranian restaurants. We would hear his music and, and kind of occasionally see him watching an Iranian film, but, but we had no kind of contact with it beyond that. And then, you know, as I think with so many people in so many cultures, I got to kind of like my, my twenties, you know, really it was like late teens and twenties. And I just felt this kind of, you know, this, this tug, this kind of pull that that was coming from somewhere and 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 eventually it 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 sort of led me there i mean it's it hasn't happened to my brother and sister you know that my 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 brother who's younger than me is he's we've been back to iran we've been back to iran together but he's very kind of content he's never really it's never been important to him and i'm not saying this in any way that it's it's not one way or the other but um necessary but neither my brother or my sister have felt compelled to kind of reconnect with Iran in that way for some reason I I I did and when it and when I went back there in 2004 for the first time in like 20 years um I just felt this um this kind of sense of of homecoming you know of kind Mm. of, of of it was like meeting a a a you know a a brother you know, it's like that. It's like that thing of you kind of seeing someone that you realise all along has been there. You know, and, and it just so many things kind of made sense. I remembered so much of it because I did. You know, I did spend the first couple of years of my life there as a baby, and then went back when I was very small once. But you know, it was like the sounds and the smells, um, the, the just the the kind of the sights. It was all there, just like sort of latent in in me. And then you know, ever since then, it's been a kind of a you know a huge part of my life. Um, mm. I still haven't figured out what it is to be, you know, to be a good Iranian. Or, uh, <laughs> so, uh, Jordan, I'm sure such a thing doesn't exist, but, you know, and I'm always going to feel unequal to that task. I think that's kind of part of the bargain. Yeah. But, it's, but it's been really, I'm sure there are plenty of people who live in Iran who would find what I do kind of slightly pathetic, I'm sure, because it does, <laughs> because it does you know, it, it does kind of, you know, probably smacks of like, you know, this, this kind of like post-memory sort of nostalgia for something that you were never really a part of. Um, but actually having heard from a lot of Iranians who who do like what I do has been uh, probably like, you know, the most rewarding part of it, you know, getting those messages from Iranians who hear certain tracks that I've done 
uh, and working with Iranian musicians, which I am at the moment. You know, I'm working with a uh, on this new record with um, a couple. Actually, I came across first of all this guy Faraz, who is plays the camonche, and he plays on this track Distancer, which which um, went up quite recently. Um, and he's just an incredible musician. I mean, he's an incredible classically trained Iranian musician who is quite. Um, overwhelmed with joy to be doing this stuff with me which is like the most amazing feeling he was actually in the studio yesterday in London and I was kind of remotely kind of dialed into this session while he was playing Camonche and I was recording and his wife uh, Malaha who is this unbelievably good singer and she also is just thrilled to be working on stuff with me so it's this like that I find just unbelievable you know there was a point last night where I was sitting with my dad watching old Iranian kind of clips and it just hit me that I was working with these like unbelievably good Iranian musicians and how lucky I am you know to be in that position that's gorgeous yeah the the track distancer as we're recording this is available for people to to check out right like that's Mm -hmm. that's out in the world and that's going to be a, yeah. I mean, I put that up as a sort of. I mean, you know, I, I self-release all my music, so yeah. I've always been. Um, I've always done that, and and um, I'm always really kind of like bad at knowing exactly how the whole PR thing should be done. Like, should <laughs> I be releasing this in August when it's kind of warm or festival season, or you know that that whole sort of thing? I've, I've always been really really bad at. But but when the kind of COVID thing kicked off the i you know there was this like sudden i had this sudden feeling of um this shift in 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 me where i just really wanted to f- i guess feel like i was doing something that might have some kind of overall benefit to people outside of my little kind of sphere uh, and you know you can argue that music may may kind of have those kind of helpful kind of properties and but just on a personal level you know my brother's a doctor my sister's a teacher and i do think that there's there's a kind of a, a renewed kind of spotlight on you know what you contribute you know as a as a yes. human being and and i do feel kind of very strongly that you know we live in a pretty backwards world you know where the people that do the work that actually keeps the the the, the kind of society that we claim to care so much about the 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 reason that can, can kind of holds together isn't because of the people in glass towers kind of moving money between accounts who are getting paid extraordinary amounts of money to, to basically kind of do these sort of abstract kind of calculations. It's the people who are, you know, going in and, 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 you know, teaching or working in hospitals or kind of picking up, you know, rubbish or, um, you know, caring for the, for the elderly. And, and I think that this has really kind of highlighted that that sort of, slightly upside down pyramid that we live in and and it just made me feel like well what can I do you know and I just sort of thought well I mean nothing other than maybe put out a piece of music that might some people might find um helpful at this time and it just so happened that I had this track that was called Distancer and had been called Distancer for a while so I thought that maybe that I would kind of put that up as a sort of you know as a sort of sign that there was more to come yeah and i love the that's a that wonderful bit of of kind of synchronicity that you had a song about distance in a time when everyone's mm. wrestling mm. with that question of what it means to be distant and yeah. I, I put the track on for the first time and there's i don't know if this was already part of the vision or you add it later but there's sort of the sounds of people together yeah that's even true. as even as it I, is that the I it's thought it was a violin or viola, but is that the common chair? That's the common chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's beautiful, aching. It almost like the instrument is almost kind of a apart from the the background noise or in front of it or something. But it's just mm-hmm. this wonderful sense of space inside of the song that yeah made me feel connected to like oh yeah even when we are apart literally like i can't we can yeah. you and i even if i lived in london you and i could only have this conversation over video as we're having yeah. it now there's, there's that's just, very true yeah i mean that, that's it's kind of weird because like you know the one one thing that this that this record has or certainly had that that, that did feel different was i became very obsessed with the idea of going out and getting field recordings going out with a you know i bought a um a, a, a one of these zoom handheld you know the, the podcast recorder thing with the, the stereo mic on it and I just started going out and and recording places you know my, my the places in London that kind of meant the most to me so I would I would go to the Barbican which is this kind of like 
brutalist gallery space in London that I love very much. Um, the, the South Bank Centre, the swimming pool that I go to a lot, they, they, they allowed me to sit in there and film the kind of, you know, the, the session in the evening, people kind of splashing up and down the pool, skateboarders on the South Bank. And then, you know, I tried to kind of weave these sounds into the tracks. And, and it's, it's, you know, I've noticed this before. I've done this kind of to a much lesser extent. But it is very interesting how when you when you put the kind of sounds of the world into a piece of music, it just it just opens it up in a way that is it almost feels like cheating. It's almost like this kind of secret. So you said to me, um, and you kind of alluded to this, but I want to maybe see if we can, without without sort of having to make some highfalutin claim here, I, I, I'm i of the opinion, actually, um, and I feel very strongly about this opinion, that if we were to look at you, you and your siblings as kind of um, embodying different parts of society, right? Like your brothers embodying the, the medicinal healing part, of, or at least one part of the healing part of society. There's other stuff there that, that he's not mm-hmm. connected with. Your, your sister's embodying the, the educational, like the passing of knowledge, the, the growing of the next generation. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you and I have talked about like, oh, I'm just, I'm just making music. Mm. Right. So what do I do now in this moment when they're quote, they're doing quote unquote really important work and I'm quote unquote, just making music. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I, I, I honor that. I honor that, that sense of there's, that's it, it, I can imagine it can, you can sit and look in their direction and go, well, that's more important than this. Mm-hmm. But, but on the same token, like I think about, I think about like what would our what what would a classroom be like if there was no great literature to study, yeah. no great yeah. music to listen to. Um, yeah. You know, there's just something about art that feels, and it's and it kind of almost actually upsets me that artists and not you're certainly not alone kind of devalue ourselves in the, yeah. in the context of this this world that we've created, but actually that the world is so much richer for having music that we can hear that brings together our Iranian culture and London sounds yeah. and, and cinematic emotion and, and like you create something really special. So I don't know. That that's very true. true. I mean, that is very true. And it's, and it, you know, actually, you know, funnily enough, I, 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 I taught myself, I, I, I went two years, I taught English at secondary school level quite recently. Um, I was I was at a point um, around the time that I was making the last album, which came out in 2016, I think. Mm. And about 2015-ish, I was just kind of a bit despondent with it. I was kind of, I, I was feeling that thing of just, you know, it, 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 had, it had been, I've been doing it for so many years and it it was kind of getting me down. You know, it just wasn't really, there was something that I felt like I was, just not getting from it you know that I just wanted to kind of do what I wanted was like a more um uh, immediate sense of kind of connecting with and um helping people in some way that just that went beyond like messages on Facebook or whatever you know it was so I so I basically um started teaching English you know I I got started working at a school um did like the, the qualification did like a you know a year of of, of teacher training mm. worked in a couple of schools in London did a full year teaching uh, as a teacher and and I loved it like I, I really got a lot from it I, I 
um, I, I, I got better at it. You know, I, to start off with, it, it was it was very difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, teaching is just incredibly hard. Yeah. You know, it's a very, very it's so hard. I mean, so I valued. I so. Ways. I mean, yeah. I know. I, I I know that over here, certainly, it's it's incredibly undervalued. My respect for teachers is now, you know, completely through the roof because ultimately, I couldn't. I couldn't hack it. I mean. Partly it was the work itself was so draining and overwhelming. I love being in the classroom. I love the actual kind of teaching part of it. But then there's this just relentless kind of barrage of sort of paperwork and politics and, you know, um, it just, it just it, it is not an easy life. And, you know, there's nothing of you left for other stuff. And I was trying to work part-time and my ambition was to kind of do like three, two, two and a half or three days a week and make music in, in the other times. And there is just, as far as I can tell, there is no part-time teaching, you know, teaching becomes your life. And I realized that I kind of couldn't do that. Mm. Um, it was, it was kind of maybe selfish. I was going into classrooms and I was like encouraging kids, you know, tr trying to get them to, to believe that they could find something that would allow them to connect with the wider world. You know, you, there is something in you, you, you will find your thing, whether it's music or, you know, kind of teaching yourselves or, you know, working and whatever. And I just kept thinking like, I miss that. I had that, you know, what I was doing was to an extent that in, in a way, and I kind of let go of it. Um, but also, I also realized that art, that was kind of when I really did realize the kind of value of art because, you know, the connections that kids would make in the classroom, invariably it was the kids that kind of had the sort of like almost the most trouble, the hardest kids, the ones that kind of teachers would talk about as really problematic. But I mean, teachers are smart. They knew they would, they, you know, they wouldn't be like that kids are, he's just a problem child. Forget about him or her. It's like, there's this kind of, especially English teachers, there's like this, they understood that there was this potential for them to connect with, with literature in a way that would take them kind of out of their lives, which were often very, very difficult. And those moments of connection, when you see it happen in a classroom, when a kid, you know, who, who maybe hasn't said anything for most of the year suddenly gets really fired up about I don't know, of mice and men or like, you know, the character of like Lady Macbeth or whatever it is. And then you realize that there is this, this kind of, th this power that art has in that way. Yeah. And I desperately wanted to get back to making it. I mean, that was, a, that was maybe a selfish decision, but it was a, but it was a kind of, a, yeah, I mean, sorry. So I've gone a kind of off topic a bit, but it did, it did occur to me, you, you, you know, the, the teaching thing, it is easy to kind of, yeah, it is easy to kind of lose track of the importance of kind of art, art life as well. Yeah, and and it seems to me that the greatest teachers, whether they're 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 classroom teachers or you know teachers of a particular lineage or or just kind of they have ideas and they found a way to share those ideas with the world. It seems to me that the greatest teachers are are helping other people find those moments of where things click. It's, mm. like the, it's like the young person who just, well, that's like me. Wait, you can yeah, do that for exactly. a living. You can, exactly. I, it's like, there's just this fire that gets lit when, when it's suddenly these two pieces of the puzzle that you didn't even know were supposed to go together. Find, find yeah, yeah. It's like the person meets the world and art has that effect on so many people. This, this, this I mean, that's, you know, and it go and it comes back to that thing you were saying earlier about not, you know, it's a, it's the difference between allowing people to kind of explore and telling people what the answers are, you know. And I think mm -hmm. that I noticed, you know, it's difficult. Like schools, schools have incredibly, you know, their resources are really stretched. They don't have the time. They don't have the the, the teachers. They don't have the, the the they. Sometimes they just have to tell kids what's going to get them through the exam. But that's a shame because when you let kids explore, I mean, Romeo and Juliet is an example, like as a, as a play, teaching that play to a class of GCSE kids in a, in a, in a part of London where there was a great kind of like diversity of kind of uh, a great kind of ethnic diversity, different cultures, different kind of backgrounds. And they would identify with that play in many different ways. You know, there's this kind of whole, the, the, the idea of masculinity, like, you know, Romeo is kind of, as being kind of pushed in towards this kind of life of, 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 of violent, 
a confrontation with members of other gangs. And these, these, these boys would just be like, I understand that. I know what that's like. I know, mm. I know what it's like to be kind of, you know, to kind of have to, to, to fight, to kind of, you know, to show that you're, you know, like a real man, even though you're a kind of 14 year old kid uh, or the forced marriage thing, you know, yeah. getting kind of pushed into this. And then there would be kids from cultures where they're like, I know what that's like. I, you know, my brother was married to someone he'd never even met and blah, blah, blah. And, and those are the moments where the whole thing opens up and you see them kind of engage with it in a way where it's, you know, their, their lives, it's, it's changing their lives, it's literally kind of like changing their lives. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really amazing thing to witness. Uh, it's so awesome. Mm. That's that. That is the power of great art. It's like mm. to open a door into truth, into possibility, into new experience. No matter where you might sit in the world, yeah. Like and it's you- about learning something about yourself. I mean, it's yeah. you know, it's it's it, it, it isn't simple enough to say like it's about learning about kind of you know catholic culture in 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 ancient italy or something like that it's not about it's not a history (laughs) lesson it's a lesson in the present it's about learning about your life your world you know your role in it and developing who you are i think that's what that's what it that's what it always is yeah i love it thank you for sharing that we don't have a ton of time left Sirius, but one theme I'm, I'm hoping we can touch on, at least in part, connects to what you shared around like having this moment of despondency and feeling like you've been working on something you love and it, and it, and you almost had to, it sounds like you had to kind of go away from it to really rediscover why you loved it and come back to it. But it strikes me that, that without knowing a lot of details, what I get from your music, I think I mentioned this at the top of the conversation, like there is this really healing quality to it. Mm. There's something for me, at least learning about myself as I encounter it in the present moment, that it's important to be able to move through a wide range of emotion as a human being, and not to always seek the one thing again and again and again, but to sort of have spaces where we can feel sadness or feel joy or feel hope or just unbridled catharsis and release and and i wonder like is there a connection for you between your art and your and mental health and and how are you how are you how would you make sense of that or how might you tell a, a young person or an aspiring artist listening to this like how to thread that needle between taking care of yourself and and taking care of your art um, I would say, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say that I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to kind of, uh, I wouldn't claim to have any kind of special knowledge on this. I mean, you know, my experience has been, and I know that certainly musicians that I know well, talk to a lot, often kind of echo this, is that really, you know, making music for a living is a mentally very destabilizing way of life. Um, especially in an age where there's this whole kind of circus of self-promotion, you know, the, 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 I was chatting to a very good friend of mine today who's, who's just finished a beautiful album, a guy called Matthew Falloon, who I, who I was um, at university with and played in bands with. Um, and he's a sort of singer songwriter, just an incredibly gifted, incredibly gifted person, musician, poet, writer, um, and he's just finished the record and he's kind of in the process now of putting together press releases and getting quotes and kind of talking to people. And, um, and I, we were chatting on the phone about this and, and the, the, this, this kind of feeling that finishing a, a, a work, you know, whether it's a song or an album, is generally kind of worse or rather larger when it's a larger project. You know, there's this great dropping off when when it's done. You know, you. Mm. I think the problem with the way that we now engage with the process of making art as kind of digital beings or whatever is that we're constantly focused on the the kind of end result, the getting it up there, getting it out there. Especially when when we know that once we have the track in our hands, we're like you know a ten minute YouTube upload or whatever away from it being disseminated around the world. And that's weird because that's not really kind of, you know, there's, I think there's this great tension between the act of making art, which should be in 
it kind of contained, like, you know, n- not at the mercy of outside forces. You shouldn't be bombarded with thoughts about its reception. I think it's especially weird that you put a piece of music up and within seconds you're seeing people kind of comment on it. I mean, at least in the age of, you know, whatever's, you know, whatever is kind of was bad about the, the, the days of like kind of major labels, at least if you were kind of putting music out in the 60s or 70s, you know, you put out a piece of music and then there'd be like at least a pause before kind of you were inundated with kind of hatred. <laughs> Whereas now it's, you know, immediately you kind of put something up and you're being bombarded with people's reactions to it. And that's kind of, you know, people, some people love that. That's Some people thrive on it and get a huge thrill from it. But I think personally what it does is it takes away from the, 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 the kind of nourishing part of making music because that is there. You know, it, it just becomes easier to miss it, I think, when you are more focused on what, you know, the, the, this kind of illusion of perfection that you're striving to kind of present this front of something completed and polished and, you know, you slowly kind of erase yourself from the work. That seems to be like the, you know, the, the kind of great challenge. And I just think, you know, in terms of, 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 of uh, mental health stuff, the one thing I would say is absolutely, you know, limit the, the amount of time you, you work on, on art. It does, I don't think it matters what it is. You know, the, for, for, the, for a long time, I would work on music all day and, and sometimes all night. And it was just soul destroying. Mm. It doesn't matter how engaged you are with it. I mean, that will that will kill you. You you need to kind of take time out. You need to kind of step away from it. You need to reflect on it. I mean, it goes without saying that those those are the times when it all comes together. I mean, it, almost every time for me, I would be you know banging my head against the sort of metaphorical brick wall, and I would step away from a piece of music and go for a run or go for a walk. And no sooner had I pretty much left the flat than I'd go ah. Oh, and I'd have to get my phone out and like record sort of <laughs> saying, drop the kick drum at whatever, you know, it's the, the, it, whatever it is. You just get what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Remind me of this idea that a, um, a music teacher of mine shared, which is most people only see that end result, that five minute song, that novel, that painting. Yeah. Almost no one sees the amount of time, energy, and work that went into making that. Mm-hmm. And if as an artist, you, or really as a human being, if you are not connecting, to that process in a meaningful way it doesn't always have to be fun and and Mm. this is great but if you're if you're not connecting to that whole journey and realizing that that end result just happens to be like a a byproduct of the fact that you just spent a year or 10 years or your whole life yeah yeah. studying an art form and working in that art form then then you lose yourself as the artist in the th- in the thing when really the thing is just happens to be something that comes out of the process that other people can look at. Yeah, I agree, and I think also it's it, the other thing that that happens naturally when you do when you do find a kind of balance when you when you are able to kind of step away from it is you do find yourself with a rekindled love of that process. You know, you do find moments where you just kind of allow yourself to be making the song that you're working on and you don't think about its relationship with past songs or future songs or, you know, you don't even necessarily think of it as a song. You just think of it as like I'm here at the piano or I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of doing this with this kind of drum or, you know, playing with this plug-in or whatever it is and and you just let it kind of, you know, you 
it just suddenly becomes like a gift. You're like, okay, this is this is good. This is better than, you know, this is better than a lot of other things that I that I have done or could be doing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So the driving question for the show, and it's a big one. I always kind of laugh when I ask this at the end because it's like, boy, should I start, should I start leading with this question? But I, I sense it's the right question to ask at the end because now we've we've put all of this these possibilities on the table. We've put on this idea of the human story and and the lineage that we're each particularly a part of, and how we find our way into our own voice and listen to what's been true for us since we were kids, while also being open to discovery and trusting the process and adding value to the world. Like there's so much here that we put on the table and, and like the big picture that I'm playing with on this podcast is that right now and, and right now is both we're recording this in May. So right now we're in the midst of pandemic, but really, I mean, right now, you know, 2020, a a fifth of the way through the 21st century, like right now at this moment in human history, there is both what feels to me like, an incredible amount of possibility and potentiality and also a really high stakes risk Mm. that the, the very fragile system of society that spans the globe that we built for ourselves is kind of in peril. Right. Mm. And, and so here we are just two like human beings, two artists, we're doing what we can in the midst of it all. But I'd love to hear you speak as we come down the home stretch here. Like what is your hope for humanity? What are you really feeling fierce about or hopeful about or even if you're not hopeful about it you'd like to feel hopeful about it where do you where would you like in the context of everything we've talked about today what are you hoping for um well that's yeah it is it is a very it is a it's enormous kind of question and and that this as you say this pandemic does have that potentiality um Crisisunity in the Simpsons, the the kind of the the crisis opportunity thing. Uh, There's this great Aaron Tatty Roy article that was in the FT. Um, It was it was kind of widely read. Uh, The author of um, the God of Small Things wrote a a piece about the pandemic as portal. There's a beautiful kind of um, closing paragraph which I you know I couldn't couldn't recite from memory but I've read it so many times probably the most kind of hopeful thing that I've read about the pandemic and it's essentially saying that you know pandemics through history have caused humanity to kind of reassess and to kind of you know to 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 tweak the the way that that we live you know as as humans and this one you know we have the opportunity to kind of walk through it dragging our you know i think she she uses the phrase dead ideas you know our kind of our our sort of dead ideas and our kind of superstitions and our kind of hatred and all the rest of it or we can you know we can we can go through it lightly kind of without all that baggage and see what 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 kind of world we lies on the other side Mm -hmm. Uh, you you know i the thing that i always feel about humanity is is uh, i try and kind of keep in mind is that you know i'm not a i'm not someone that believes that there's some kind of like program towards which we're not i don't see us as kind of on any kind of like trajectory towards a kind of enlightenment you know i don't see a kind of godhead like sort of destiny for humanity what i think we've done is i think we've come a great deal of a distance from a you know protoplasmic and then kind of like you know sort of ape like and and you know, we've, we've we've come so far but we're still at the mercy of really kind of basic kind of animalistic mm. um urges and and instincts and they are very easily kind of used for to, to really nefarious ends you know we've done a really good job of being pretty terrible to each other throughout history you know and to the world that we that we live in um we've done a lot of good and we've created a lot of good things but i think the balance is is generally towards you know um i just see the world uh, that we that we that we seem to be kind of in at the very least the world that we seem to be kind of like leaving behind in in terms of that portal if, if if such a thing exists so much of it is manipulative you know so much of it is about telling people what, what what they need what they lack what 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 where where they're incomplete you know and the things that it, that are suggested as completing us you know whether it's some 
you know, perfume ad, you know, whether it's like this idea that you're going to, you know, you, you if you get a certain amount of money or if you can afford a certain kind of like, you know, holiday or if you if you watch kind of this program and keep up with these kind of this family of like, you know, extremely kind of wealthy, like American suburbanite housewives or whatever it is. I mean, all of that stuff to me now feels potentially like it might ring hollow with people because people are suddenly realizing that actually life is a lot more fragile, you know, life is a lot more precarious. The future isn't kind of guaranteed and we aren't necessarily destined for, you know, great things. You know, we might not, <laughs> we might not, you know, colonize Mars or kind of go out in space. It might all end here and maybe that's fine, but let's try and kind of, kind of create a world where, where we value each other for what we are, you know, which which really is is kind of much more simple than all of that stuff suggests, and much more complicated. But ultimately, you know, there's a there's a there's a poem that my dad reads in um, this the, on this new album. I'm finishing again with a track with my dad reading kind of old Iranian poems, and it's a very famous one that he finishes reading. Um, um, and I, I'm pretty sure it's by Saadi again. Uh, and it's it's basically um, about humanity, and the the line that he ends on is, um, if you if you if you basically if you don't kind of empathise with the suffering of other humans, you don't deserve to be called human. Mm. And that I think is you know what I really struggle with is I get that the kind of like the mechanism of the world as it is organised is essentially kind of exploitative you know it it is it is a machine that works by kind of grinding a a great kind of swathe of the world's population into the ground it assumes that they will not have lives in which they can be happy you know in which they or rather you know i yeah i i don't know i just i feel like um I feel like we we need to just side with humans a little bit more, and maybe that sounds kind of a bit more a bit um you know a, a, maybe it's a bit kind of airy but uh yeah i would like to I'd like to see a world where where kind of we're just a bit kinder you know a bit wiser yeah to that we'll see we'll see we certainly, we certainly yeah. will see won't we it's it's one it's one it's one possibility for yeah. sure well. Cirrus, I am grateful to you for making music, for making art that is not manipulative, that invites people in. And that helped, for me at least, it has helped me hold things a lot lot more lightly, as you Mm -hmm. said. Well, that's a wonderful thing to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, And I think it is an invitation, your invitation for us, and Saadi's invitation for us to to realize that we are each other's keeper. Mm. That, that's what makes us human. Not, not what perfume you wear or what job title we have or, or any of the other machinations that, that benefit some few over many of us, that there might be a way in which all of us can thrive on this planet. And I think that's, uh, that's worth giving it, giving it a go. Oh, I'm, in. I'm, I'm in, I'm in. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for being in the Wonder Dome. This has been a real, real pleasure. Yeah, really has been fun, Andy. Thank you so much, Chuck, yeah. for taking the time to chat to me. Is that? If you're moved by the music you heard throughout the show, make sure to check out this episode's show notes on my website, mindfulcreative.coach, where you can find info about all the music and all of Sirius's work. And now, here's his song, Precipice, in its entirety.
Thanks for tuning in to The Wonder Dome. This podcast was produced by me, Andy Cahill, with support from Kelly Serqua, and audio editing services from John Nolan at Middle Mountain Studios. The theme song was written and performed by Todd Marston. You can find The Wonder Dome wherever pods are casted. If you dig what we're doing here, please share widely, subscribe, and give us some love in the review boards. And if you feel called to support this humble offering to the world, while also making an even greater impact in the lives of others, consider becoming a monthly supporter. Not only will you help me keep the lights on and keep this show going for as long as I'm able, but 30% of all member contributions go directly in support of causes like the Black Lives Matter movement, the United Nations Refugee Agency, and the National Resources Defense Council. You can find out more at my website, mindfulcreative.coach, where you can also sign up for my newsletter, learn about my transformational coaching work, and get plugged into exclusive offers and community happenings. In the meantime, I'm wishing you a life of purpose, power, and presence. We need you now, more than ever.